you wrote a book, The Origins of the Slavic Nations. So let's go back into history. What is the origin of uh, Slavic nations? We can look at that, at that from different perspectives. And we are now making uh, major breakthroughs in, in answering this question with the uh, very interesting innovative linguistic analysis, the study of DNA. So that's, that's, that's really the new frontier. We are getting into a prehistorical period where there is no historical sources. And from what we can understand today, and that can, of course, change tomorrow with all these breakthroughs um, in, in sciences, is that uh, the, the Slavs came into existence somewhere in the area of um, marshes, Pripet marshes, northwestern part of Ukraine, uh, southwestern part of Belarus, eastern part of Poland. And that is considered to be a historical homeland of Slavs, and then, and then they spread. And they spread all the way to the Adriatic, so we have Croats, we have Russians spreading all the way to the Pacific, we have Ukrainians, we have Belarusians, Poles, once we had Czechoslovaks, now we have, we have Czechs and Slovaks. So that's the story of starting with the 8th and 9th century, we can, even a little bit earlier, we can already follow that story with the help of the, of the written sources, mostly from Byzantine, then, then, then later from Western, from Western um, Europe. But what uh, I was trying to do, not being a scientist, not being an expert in, in linguistics, or not being an expert in, in, in DNA analysis, I was trying to see what was happening in the minds of those peoples, and the elites in particular, whom we call today not Slavs, but Eastern Slavs, which means Russians, Ukrainians, and Belarusians. How they imagine themselves, how they imagine their world, and eventually I look at the so-called nation-building projects. So trying to answer the question of how we arrived uh, to the situation in which we are today, where there are not just three East Slavic nations, but there are also three East Slavic states, uh, Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian. So this is, this is the focus of my, of my book. I end, admittedly, in that particular book, I end uh, on the 18th century, before the era of nationalism, but then there are other books like Lost, uh, Lost Kingdom, that where I, I bring the story all the way up to today. So, what aspects of the eighth and ninth century, uh, the East Slavic states permeates to, to, to today that we should understand? Well, the the most important one is that the existence of the state of Kiev and Rus, mm -hmm. uh, back during the medieval period. Uh, created the uh, foundations uh, for um, historical mythology, common historical mythology, and there are just wars and battles over who has the right, mm -hmm. or, or more right for Kiev and Rus. Uh, the legal code that was created at that time existed for a long period of time. The acceptance of Christianity from Byzantium, that became a big issue that separated then Eastern Slavs from their Western neighbors, including Czechs and, 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 and Poles, uh, but uh, united in that way to, let's say, Bulgarians or Serbs. And uh, the beginning of the written literature, uh, beginning, beginning in Kiev. So all of that is uh, considered to be part of heritage. All of that is being contested. Uh, and uh, this, this debates that were academic for a long period of time what we see now tragically are being being continued on so, the on the battlefield. What is Kiev? What is Rus that you mentioned? What's the importance of these? You, you mentioned them as a sort of defining places and uh, terms, labels at the beginning of all of this. So, what, what is Kiev? Uh, Kiev uh, became a capital uh, or, or the, the outpost of the uh, Vikings who were tra uh, trying to establish control over the um, trade route between um, what, what is today's uh, Western Russia and, and, and Belarus and Northern Ukraine, so the forest areas, and the biggest and the richest market in the world that existed at that time which was in Constantinople, in Byzantium. 
So the idea it was the idea was to get whatever goods you can get in that part of Eastern Europe, and most of those goods were slaves, local population. Put them on the ships uh, in Kiev because Kiev was on the border with the steppe zones. Steppe zones were controlled by other people, other groups. Uh, Scythians, Sarmatians, uh, Polovtsians, uh, Pechenegs, and so on, and so you, 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 you name it. And then staying on the, on the river, being protected from attacks of the nomads to come to the Black Sea and, and sell these products in Constantinople. That was, that was the idea. That was the model. Uh, Vikings, Vikings tried to practice that sort of, of, of uh, uh, business model also in other parts of, of Europe. And like in other parts of Europe, they turned out to be, by, by default, creators of new polities, of new states. And that was, that was the story of the first, of the first Kievan dynasty. And Kiev, as the capital of that huge empire that was going f- from the Baltics to today's central Ukraine, and then was trying to get through the southern Ukraine to, to the Black Sea, that was a major, major European state kingdom, if you, if you want to call it, of medieval Europe, with a lot, uh, creating a lot of tradition in terms of dynasty, in terms of language, in terms of religion, in terms of, uh, again, historical mythology. So Kiev is central for uh, for the uh, uh, nation uh, m- nation building myth of a number a number of groups in the region. So, in one perspective and narrative, Kiev is at the center of this Russian Empire. At which point does Moscow become come to prominence as the center of the Russian Empire? Well, the Russian Empire is a term and really creation of the 18th century. Uh, what we what we have for the Kievan, we call it Kievan Rus. Again, this is a term of the 19th century. They call themselves Rus. Rus. And there was Metropolitanate of Rus, and there was Rus Principalities. So very important to keep in mind that Rus is not Russia, because that was a self-name for all multiple groups on that on that territory. And uh, Moscow uh, doesn't exist at the time when Kiev emerges as, as the capital. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, first, the first reference to Moscow uh, comes from the 12th century when it was founded by one of the Kievan, one of the Kievan princes. And uh, Moscow comes to prominence really in a very different context and with a very different empire running the show in the region. The story of Moscow and the rise of Moscow, this is the story of the Mongol rule over, over former Rus lands and former Rus territories. Um, uh, the, the part of the former Rus eventually overthrows the, the Mongol control with the help of the small group of people called Lithuanians, which which had a young young state and young dynasty and and united the, these lands which were mostly in today's terms Ukrainian and Belarusian, so they separate early, and what is today's Russia mostly Western Russia Central Russia stays under the Mongol control up until late 15th century, and that was the story when Moscow. Moscow rises as the new capital of that realm, replacing the city of Vladimir uh, as as that capital. Uh, for those who ever went to Russia, uh, they they familiar with the with of course Vladimir as the place of the mm, uh, oldest uh, uh, architectural monuments. Uh, the so-called the Golden Ring of Russia, and so on and so forth. Vladimir is central, and there are so many architectural monuments there because before there was Moscow there was Vladimir eventually in this in this struggle over over control of the territory struggle for favors uh, from from the Mongols and, and and the Tatar horde Moscow emerges as as the center of that particular realm under Mongols after the Mongol rule is uh, removed 
Moscow embarks on the project that historians, Russian historians of the 19th century, called the gathering of the Russian lands. Uh, using Russian now for Rus and 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 trying to to uh, bring back the mm, the the lands of of former Kiev and Rus, but also the lands of the former Mongol Empire. Uh, the Russians get to the uh, Pacific before they get to Kiev uh, historically, uh, and uh, really the the the. Uh, Quote unquote gathering of the uh, uh, quote unquote Russian lands ends only in 1945 when uh, the Soviet Union uh, uh, bullies the Czechoslovak government into turning what is today's Transcarpathian Ukraine to the Soviet Union. It is included in the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So that's that's the moment when that destiny, the way how it was imagined by the 19th century Russian historian was eventually fulfilled. Moscow was in control of all this lands. So to what degree are the Slavic people one people, and this is a theme that will continue throughout, I think, versus a collection of multiple peoples, whether we're talking about the Kievan Rus or we're talking about the 19th century Russian Empire conception? Well, a number of ways to look at that. One, the most obvious, the most clear is language. And um, th there is no question that um, Poles speak a separate language in their Slavs. And there is no question for um, anyone um, going to Ukraine and hearing Ukrainian, realizing that this is not Russian. The level of comprehension can be different. You can understand certain words, and you, you you don't understand others. And the same would be with with Polish, and the same would be with Czech. So uh, there is this linguistic uh, linguistic uh, history that is in common, but languages very clearly indicate that you're de you're dealing with different with different peoples. Um, uh, we we know that language is not everything. Americans speak a particular way of English. Australians speak a particular variant of English. Uh, but for reasons of geography, history, we we pretty much believe that despite linguistic unity, these are different nations and different peoples. And and the, the, there are there are some parts of political tradition are in common. Others others are quite different. Uh, so the same uh, wh when it comes to language, the same when it comes to political tradition, to the loyalty to the political institution applies to Slavic uh, nations. So that's, that's again, the, 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 there is nothing particularly unique about the Slavs in that regard. 